one thing I wish I knew then that I that I know now is like, you know, there's always going to be ups and downs getting to any goal in life. Um, and all that matters is, is, is how you respond to those downs and how you respond mm -hmm. to a lot of those problems that are going to be created. Um, because ultimately, at the end of the day, um, that's what you're going to have to do to achieve your goal, right? Hey there, welcome to Make It Rain, multifamily real estate investing for millennials. I'm Luke. And I'm Daisy. And with every episode, whether we're discussing a special topic or have an amazing guest, the goal is to provide education and resources for anyone interested in investing in multifamily real estate, especially if you're a millennial. Yes, we're excited to chat with you about the what, the whys, the hows, and the who's. Enjoy the show. Welcome back, everybody, to Make It Rain Multifamily Real Estate Investing for Millennials. This is Luke. Hey, and this is Daisy, and we are excited for our first guest of 2022. Welcome to the show, Rich. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm a big fan of your uh, your podcast and a big fan of what you guys are doing, and so it's definitely an honor to uh, be here. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Yeah. I feel like this has been a, a long time coming, right? We met you uh, through the po podcast collaboration that we did with a few other awesome podcasters. And we actually met your partner, Sean, first. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, met you, I think, on the second show. Um, when we recorded the second show, you know, you were um, the guest, right, for the Multifamily Takeoff, which is your own podcast. So we'll dig into your story and learn more about you, but definitely wanted to highlight uh, you know, what a, What an awesome group it's been for us to be part of that um, podcast collaboration and sort of turn into this mini mastermind where now we can ask questions and, you know, talk about personal things as well. So it's it's fun to bring this full circle and have you now on the show. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're definitely right. I mean, it's a, it's a great group of individuals and I've definitely enjoyed being a part of it and I'm super excited for this conversation tonight. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, as you may or may not know, we always start off with a uh, with a non multifamily related topic for the first question. So we'd like to know what a what's a, a childhood or adult nickname that your closest circle calls you, Rich. Ooh, so my family when I was a kid they called me Didi, and my mom grew up in Taiwan. And so Didi means little brother in Taiwanese. Uh -huh. And so like my close family when I was a kid used to call me Didi growing up. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. That's so cute. Love the, the cultural connection also back to your family. So we'll mm -hmm. jump right into your story, Rich. Uh, if you mind walking our listeners through your journey, what you've uh, you know done, how you got to where you are today and what it is that you focus on these days. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up um, like most people. Um, I was taught from a young age to go to school, get good grades, go to college and get a job. And for the most part, that's what I did. Um, my mom was an immigrant from uh, Taiwan. Um, and uh, they know the value of working hard and, and, and saving money. Um, while I was going to school, I was always worked like retail jobs since I was a kid. Um, and then I got into sales while I was going to college and started selling cell phones. And um, I actually sold cars um, for Nissan. And that was the first time I realized in my life, like, wow, like I, I actually enjoy sales. Um, and so I thought I wanted to sell commercial real estate when I got out of school. So mm -hmm. got out in 2008 and I interviewed with a couple commercial brokerages, uh, CB Richard Ellis and Grubbin Ellis to name two of them. And uh, it was 2008, the economy was starting to come down and they pulled those internship positions. They were like, hey, we love your hustle, but this is not a good time to get into this field. So mm -hmm. found myself working on the car a lot, trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And my dad um, told me about the FAA, government position, that's hiring air traffic controllers with no experience. And so in a time when uh, there was not a lot of jobs to be had out there, I applied to this and sh um, they called me and said, hey, can you be out in Oklahoma City in, in two weeks? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. So um, ended up doing that for 11 years as an air traffic controller. And along the way, um, I got into uh, just like... I started reading like books. I, I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, completely changed everything. And I was like, man, I need to change everything I'm doing. So started, um, you know, listening to a lot of podcasts and diving into a lot of books. I literally for like a six month period, I didn't do anything. And I just studied and I just like learned everything I could about real estate and uh, apartments specifically. And at the time, I did what everyone told me not to do. Uh, they said it was a little too risky, but I cashed out my 401k and I pulled out a home equity line of credit against my primary residence here in San Diego, where I live, and um, started buying some cash producing real estate. First deal I bought was a 11-unit uh, apartment building in Cincinnati. 
And then shortly after that, I bought a uh, partner with a couple of my partners that I still have today, Sean and Mike. And we bought, we JV'd a 32 unit deal in Indianapolis, which we're actually selling now. That's going to be our first deal that we go for a full cycle with that should close here in a couple of days. Um, and then started a podcast and um, learned how to raise some money and took down some couple larger syndications this past year. Um, and I've been buying some short term rentals like along the way. Um, and just realized like, man, these things cash flow so great. The tax benefits are so awesome. So decided to uh, uh, scale the, the short term rental side of the portfolio um, this year. So that's what we're going to be focusing on this year. Um, and yeah, that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, so many, so many nuggets, so many things to get into. But one of the main ones that stood out to me is, you know, you started, uh, you know, you did exactly what everybody told you not to do multiple mm -hmm. times, right throughout mm -hmm. your, your life. Why is that? Where did that come from for you to say, okay, this is conventional knowledge or conventional advice that everybody out there is doing, I'm going to go and do the completely opposite thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of like society pressures out there and a lot of things that, you know, even close family and friends might say that might not be the best advice. Um, but like, you know, like I remember when I cashed out my 401k when I was just getting started. I remember like a lot of people in my life were like a little, they would question it and they're like, are you sure you want to do that? Um, and they would, you know, outline a lot of the risks. And at the end of the day, like all those risks that people allude to are real. So put some weight on them. But on the other side of the balance scale is another risk. And it's this, like I could be 80 years old one day. You guys could be 80 years old one day. Any of the listeners could be 80 years old one day, staring in your bed or mm -hmm. laying in your bed, staring at the ceiling kicking yourself because you never fucking try to anything in life. How about mm -hmm. that risk? That's a risk too, that a lot of people don't talk about. Yeah. And so you're kind of looking at like the opportunity cost of it and you're, and you're thinking, okay, well, yeah, there's a risk here, but if I don't do it, it's even worse. Right. Because then I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not just going to lose money. Like and in one instance, you can lose money, but in the other instance, like you're losing all this time, which you really can't get back. You can make money back. It's a, it's a renewable resource, right? But time, yeah. it's like we haven't figured out how to get that back yet. And so yeah. you're looking at it like I could lose decades of my life and then look up one day and and have and be a you know an old man like filled with regret, literally. Right, one hundred percent. And like one of my favorite quotes, I don't even know who who uh, came up with this one, but one of my favorite quotes out there is, "Don't fear failure, fear regret." Mm. You know. Mm -hmm. And so I think whenever I have a decision to be made, um, I always look at the worst possible s outcome. And if I'm okay with the worst possible outcome, um, I'm usually going to take action because I just don't want to regret the things that I didn't take action on when I was younger, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that's huge, right? Kind of thinking back, I remember when I met Luke and he's, you know, talked about he didn't put any money into his retirement because he wasn't mm -hmm. banking on it. And I thought, who is this guy? Crazy guy, right? Um, but, you know, now knowing what we know, it's, you know, there's so many options, right, to get to where somebody wants to be. Some people use retirement as a means to invest. Other people would rather invest directly, right, and have access to, to capital. And that's the beauty of the space that we're in is that it's there's no right or wrong. There's just so many options out there. Um, so for you, uh, Rich, if you don't mind walking us through, you started, you know, with your own property. You mentioned the uh, 11 unit that you bought on your own and then, you know, JV it on the, onto the 32. Mm -hmm. What was the mental shift that you had to make to go from not owning anything, not having any property to buying the 11, the 32, and then scaling to significantly bigger properties after that? Yeah, absolutely. When I when I bought that first 11 unit, I was I was scared. I was a little bit nervous because, you know, you read all the books and you listen to all the podcasts and, and, and you think those those principles all work. And it sounds good in theory. You hear of other people, you know, buying properties and it working out, but you never really know until you do it. Right. And so, um, you know, buying that first 11 unit was 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 very scary. Um, but I learned so much along the way, you know, like I, for example, with that one, we closed and um, I hired the wrong property manager. And so literally like six weeks into the project, I'm just like, man, like this is just not working out. And so I had to pivot and, and bring in a new property manager. And so that was a, a learning experience in its own. Um, and, and just all those different little things that go into a, a deal, especially your first deal, you know, um, doing the rent, the unit renovations and the turns and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, I think like looking back to answer your question, like one thing I wish I knew then that I, that I know now is like, you know, 
there's always going to be ups and downs getting to any goal in life. Um, and all that matters is, is, is how you respond to those downs and how you respond mm -hmm. to a lot of those problems that are going to be created. Um, because ultimately at the end of the day, um, that's what you're going to have to do to achieve your goal. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's almost, it's like that old adage almost, um, it's not what, it's not what happens in life, but how you respond to it. Um, exactly. Um, I'm wondering about how you, because you mentioned that there was risk involved, of course, with as there is with any investment. How did you evaluate that risk on that first one? Because I'm thinking of our listeners and a lot of them are are a little more green, right? And they're mm -hmm. looking at Rich and they're saying, oh man, like he was able to move forward. He was able to like pull the trigger on this 11 unit, which potentially is like a big, is a, is a larger size, right? If you're doing that all by yourself, mm -hmm. how did you evaluate the risk and and look at it and say, okay, I want to do this deal. This is the right deal for, yeah. for, for this case. That's a great question. Uh, Luke's like, I think what gave me the confidence to move forward with that particular one was that I, I had been analyzing and, and, and underwriting a ton of deals leading up to that one. And I was looking in different markets. Um, I knew my ability to buy, like I knew how much I had for a down payment and a rehab and that sort of thing. And so I really just like honed in on all these different markets and looked at a bunch of deals. And so when I found this one, I knew it was the best one I had come across and it was just time to take action. Like at that point, I think I had been studying real estate and apartment investing for probably about nine months straight. And I was just like, I just needed to get a deal done at that point. And so I, I told myself, as soon as I find the right one that hits these parameters, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to try to find the best deal out there. Um, I'm not going to look for years and years trying to find it because you, you might never do it. Right. And so um, I ended up just taking action and moving forward on on that particular one because of it. Yeah, yeah. And can you walk us then through now, going from that 11 unit, 32 where you JV'd, right, with your two mm -hmm. partners, and then from there decided to go bigger and, <clears throat> excuse me, decided to go bigger and scale together. Um, how did that process come about? And what are the roles that each of you play within, uh, within the company? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So we that whole partnership came to fruition in our so Sean and Mike are both air traffic controllers as well. That's our background, the three of us. And so um, <laughs> it actually came to fruition in our break room. Um, we this is this is going back a little bit, but Mike had just purchased a fourplex in Cleveland. And this is before I even like uh, got into the real estate investing stuff or read any books about it. And I was like, man, that is so cool. Like, I want to learn more about it. And so Mike was like, hey, go read this. Go read this book and, and then we can hop on a call. And uh, I read it and just like just became obsessed. So fast forward, um, we're the three of us are like all looking for individual deals to buy on our own. We are looking at smaller deals. And um, I came up with the idea and I, I approached them. I said, Hey, guys, like, I think I think we're doing this wrong. Like, I, I think I think we need to think a little bit bigger. Maybe we should put our capital together and see if we can take down a larger deal. And I brought that idea to them and they were both like, you know what, I think that's a great idea. Let's do it. And so that's kind of how the partnership came to fruition in terms of the roles. Um, I do a lot of like acquisition, acquisition stuff. So um, networking with the brokers, establishing the deal flow. Um, I do a lot of capital raising as well. And then um, Mike does a lot of the asset management. He works side by side with like our legal team. Um, he works with our CPA. And then Sean does a lot of the um, construction management for our rehabs, working with the different vendors and uh, that sort of thing. He also works with our lenders as well. Nice, nice. It, it sounds like it's a pretty good mix in terms of the the different roles that you guys end up playing. And I'm sure there's a little bit of overlap here and there, but it, it sounds like you each are in your own functional group that what's needed in order to get a, a deal across the table. Yeah, no, absolutely. We uh, like whenever whenever we get into a new project, um, we're, we're very um, honed in on our roles and it's, we're very clear on what our roles are. We try not to overlap too many things. Um, and so if there's a particular item that needs to be done, uh, for example, like if it's a document that needs to be signed or we need to get a payoff letter from one of our lenders, like sh that's Sean's role and he goes and takes care of it. Um, since then, like I've, we've started to like, kind of like delegate some items. Like I have an assistant now that does a lot of the, um, a lot of the day to day stuff, the stuff that, that I just was doing for a while. One of my roles within our group was like the podcast, um, you know, scheduling guests and all that sort of stuff. And so, um, now a lot of our stuff is kind of delegated out, which has allowed me to kind of focus on, um, 
just growing um, different streams of income and being more of a, a visionary, if, if you would. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Working on the business instead of in the business, right? I exactly. heard a, a quote, it was a stoic quote recently, and they said, sometimes more, less is more, right? If you can mm-hmm. do less and focus on those key things that are going to move your life, your business, you know, so many things forward, then it's it's worth right, taking a step back from the tasks and the day to day to be able to focus on those big things once you can delegate that out. Yeah, one hundred percent. And another takeaway I, I've kind of learned as I, I've gone through this this real estate investing stuff, and and I didn't realize this when I was younger, but um, this might help your audience as well. Is like most people when they come up with a plan, um, they have a three step thought process, and it works like this. So step one is like, hey, I have an idea, I'm going to do it. And step two, most people go into a planning phase. And then step three, they'll take action. The problem with that process is most people get into a planning phase and they wait for the plan to be perfect before they take action. So they never end up taking action. Um, And so one thing I've learned is like, like it's most successful entrepreneurs and, and, and I'm starting to become this way, but I was never this way um, is, is step one, you come up with the idea like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then step two is take action. Mm-hmm. And then step three is figure out, figure out a plan as you go. And I think the more I operate like that with my new ideas, the, the, the more successful I am. Yeah. A lot more of a ready fire aim instead of, instead of yeah. ready aim fire. Right, one hundred percent. You had um, you had talked about when you were when you were talking to Mike, I believe it was, and he had the four unit, and you guys mm-hmm. were were chatting, um, going back a bit, and you were like, "Wow, that's so cool! He owns a four unit." Like, yeah. what 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 do you think it is that people are so like? I mean, because I feel the same way. I'm like, yeah, that's that's awesome. He had a four unit. Like, I feel like we're all enamored with like this idea of owning real estate. Like, what do you what do you think that is? Like, where do you think that comes from for all of us that were just we're like gung ho on that, on, on having that, you know? Yeah. It's, it's funny. Like looking back to that conversation we had in the break room, like I just, I didn't really fathom like, Oh, like this is like one of my buddies from work. He's an air traffic controller and he owns like a four unit apartment building. Um, it's just, it's just a little bit different. Like you don't meet people every day that own apartment buildings and like, you know, us being in the industry and you guys, I'm, I'm sure feel the same way. Like we're sometimes we like, we're so embedded with all these other individuals that are, you know, in real estate investing and they own apartments. We're interviewing them on our podcast and we're hosting meetups and all that sort of thing. So it becomes normal. But man, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, if you think about like the actual percentage of the American population that actually own um, investment real estate or apartment building specifically, is it's very, very rare to come by. Like I don't meet someone every day in my elevator or at the gym, uh, that owns apartment buildings. It's, it's just, it's just a rare thing. And so I think at first for me, I was like in awe, I was like, wow, this is so cool. Like I want to figure out how to do this, you know? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it becomes the norm, right? Especially because we are surrounded, uh, you know, by it so much. And I think the other side of it is that because we are surrounded by people that are doing so much more than, you know, what we want to do, and it it really just continues to elevate you, right? Uh, Maybe to think outside of the box or think of things that you wouldn't have thought before. Uh, You mentioned, uh, you know, you have a few other entrepreneurial uh, endeavors that you're working on right now as well. Um, Talk to us about one. uh, I'd love to hear where your entrepreneurial spirit comes from. Uh, If you know, you know, in terms of growing up, what you Mm -hmm. heard, like what made you feel that you could be an entrepreneur? And two, uh, what are some of those new projects that you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, first of all, I I had no idea um, that I was even like born to be an entrepreneur, uh, my entire life. I mean, it, it wasn't until my mid thirties when I, you know, fully left the air traffic control thing and really like dove into this industry is it, to when I really realized, man, like I was always born to be an entrepreneur. I just never knew because I just wasn't introduced to it. Mm. Um, and so I think the first time I like really realized that was when I left the full-time job and I was like, okay, I'm fully on my own. 
and I get to control what I do with my time, but also I get to control how much money I make. And mm -hmm. it just excites me. I don't know. And, and, and then when I, I, I listen a lot to, I listen to like a lot of podcasts um, and I read a lot of books that are like very business oriented or entrepreneur oriented. And the more I learn about the traits that make a good entrepreneur, I'm like, whoa, I actually have a lot of those. I just didn't realize it. Like I never was a good student. I always hated school growing up. Um, I'm the type of guy that's like, Hey, like, I'd rather just cheat on the test. Like, tell me what I need to do. I want to do the bare minimum. I don't want to waste <laughs> my time learning stuff. That's not going to matter. That's just how I always was, you know? And so that's kind of how business is too. You know, it's like, you got to just find the shortcut to get to the solution. And it doesn't matter how you get there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, what was your second question, Daisy? Yeah. And the second one was, you know, once you figured out that you had this entrepreneurial spirit, uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned that you have some some new endeavors that are coming up. Uh, what are those what do those look like and how do they come about? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's been really challenging for us to find deals to pencil in the apartment space. Um, like we bought a couple deals last year, but those deals just aren't around anymore. Um, and it's just been really, really competitive out there in the marketplace. Um, a lot of offers on all these properties. Um, and like, for example, like the 32 unit we're selling right now, I mean, this is 1960s product in uh, the suburbs of Indianapolis and the buyers are paying like a 3.7 cap. Well, I'm like, I don't, I don't even know how that makes sense, you know, wow. and so we're competing with those types of buyers out there and they're raising money for this deal. And so um, we're just like, man, along the way, we've been buying some short term rentals and we're like, man, these things are cash flowing so great. It's almost impossible to like you could pick any 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 property on the MLS in in any market around the country and you could short term rental it and it's probably going to be a good deal. Like that's how easy it is to find good deals in that space. And so. We decided to pivot. We're going to launch a fund here um, come April of this year with our investors to go buy $20 million worth of short-term rentals in select markets around the country. And so thinking about that, um, I've been really, really honing in and like trying to improve um, my skills as like a short-term rental operator. Um, and so with that, I identified a shortage um, and a gap in the marketplace for like a true turnkey short term rental um, investment vehicle. So I'll give you an example. So like for uh, someone out there that has a full time career or maybe they're a doctor, they're an attorney, whatever it might be, um, but they want to diversify into some real estate and they want to own real estate, but they don't care to do any of the work. Um, nor do they have the time. So we'll actually help them identify a property that would do really well as a short term rental in select markets around the country. We'll help them close on it. So they'll actually own 100% of the property. And then the team will design it and uh, we'll manage it for them. So it's completely hands off. We'll take care of all the, uh, the cleans, the property turnovers, the maintenance, the accounting, everything. So it's completely hands off and passive to the investor. And then they get all the benefits that come with owning investment real, real estate, you know, the, the cash flow, the loan pay down, the tax benefits and the long term appreciation. So decided to start this company. It's called Fortune Cribs. And um, that's pretty much what we do. It's it's been fun. It's been uh, there's been a lot of learning lessons along the way, but uh, I don't know exactly where it's headed. But uh, I'm having fun with it. <laughs> well, and that kind of and that kind of fits with uh, with your philosophy, right? Of being able yeah. to take action right away. By the way, I love the name, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> like how awesome how name. great is the name? Because it's like immediately nobody's going to forget that name, and they're yeah. like, okay, Fortune Cribs, that's rich, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's funny because like sometimes picking a name for a business can be like the the biggest bottleneck, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, you want to pick something that has an available like URL, like a domain, but also like an available like Instagram handle, right? And so um, there was a lot of like cool names that I came up with. And I'm like, man, there's like no URL, there's no Instagram handle, but somehow Fortune Cribs, the URL was just sitting there available and no one had the Instagram handle. So I'm like, okay, this has got to be the one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. It was a, it was meant to be for you. And why not rich cribs? You know, I think that would have been pretty cool too. Yeah. Um, you know what? I don't know. I didn't even think about that one. That, that would be pretty funny. <laughs> it's funny. So I'm just how, kidding. That's a <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 how it came to fruition actually is I, I had ordered some, uh, some Chinese food that night. It was takeout and I had a fortune cookie and I thought, Oh, wow. fortune, that's kind of a cool name. What about fortune cribs? <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's, it's cool. It's a it's a really cool name. I like it a lot, especially. I mean, for us, we have a we have a fairly unique name in the industry mm-hmm. as well. So, um, sure. so it's cool to end up seeing that too. Uh, can you talk to us about some of your your big lessons learned along the way, going from zero to eleven to thirty two to syndication to short term rental? Yeah. So one of the one of the biggest uh, learning lessons and one of the biggest mistakes that that I made along the way was um, running out of money. So when we got into our 32 unit deal, we closed on it. Um, we we were undercapitalized and the uh, unit renovations were costing more than we had projected. Um, and COVID had just hit like literally a few months after we closed. Um, and so we made a lot of mistakes with that property, but one of them was we were just running really, really low on, on liquidity. Um, we're getting through these unit renovations. We're probably only done with, you know, 20, 25% of the units. And we're like, man, our operating account is getting very, very low. These things were not least, they were not releasing out, uh, very, very easily at the time COVID had just dropped and it was, it was hard to, to keep the place fill. And so our occupancies dip in, we're running out of money. And luckily, um, one of our partners had a source that was able to uh, give us a second mortgage. And so it was a private loan. Um, it was unsecured. And we were able to secure a second mortgage on this property, which gave us the liquidity to finish our business plan, which was huge. Um, because without that, I don't know... Um, how it would have turned out, but I do know that like we would have figured out a solution. Right. And so, um, I think the biggest takeaway is like, don't ever run out of money. Um, but if you are a betting man and I mean, if if you're a problem solver, um, if you get into a pinch, even like that, there's, there's, there's solutions that you can, you can come up with that will still get you to the end goal. And so fast forward to now we're closing on that property as, as, as a sale, we had no intentions to sell, but the property next door, traded for like this outrageous number and we're like ask the broker like well what can we get and Mm -hmm. um the the number was like we're like there's no way that we're gonna get that he's like yeah we can we can get it for you and so sure enough we're like okay if you can get us that number we'll we'll, we'll list the property so we ended up listing it and uh yeah knock on wood we're closing here in a couple days and um yeah that that, that's gonna be a fun one so then 1031 that into um some short-term rentals Nice, nice. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, for for you, what do you what do you feel like is next? You know, along in your journey, uh, maybe if you're, it sounds like you're not quite as much of a planner. You're more, at least mm-hmm. you're you're training yourself really to be an action taker. Yeah. Um, what do you feel like is next, and, and what are those other goals that you want to that you have that are left to achieve here? Honestly, Luke, I have no idea what's next. Like, I don't <laughs> plan more than like a uh, uh, a few months out. Like, literally, like. I'm thinking about 2022. What's after 2022? I have no idea. So like what I'm focused <laughs> on right now is is two things. Like with Pack 3, we're going to we're going to launch a fund with our investors to go buy short-term rentals. No idea like where the fund's going to go. I don't even know the logistics around this fund and the properties we're going to buy. We don't even know which markets. We have no idea how it's going to go. But we do know that we're going to do it. We're going to figure out how um, along the way with Fortune Cribs. Um, I have some short term goals, you know, like we want to we want to onboard X amount of clients and we want to um, onboard X amount of like properties that we don't own, like third party. But um, I have no idea like where it's going to go. Like it's 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 fun, though. I'm having a great time with it and I'm just taking everything day by day. It's 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 been a fun process. Yeah, it's that entrepreneurial spirit, right? I, I yeah. think I've heard once that, you know, the the normal av- entrepreneur that is successful will have like six or seven businesses before the big one, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and not to say that this isn't right, but it's just yeah. dabbling and, and doing different things. And you figure out one, what's working and, you know, what some of those mistakes are, but also what you don't like, because I'm sure, you know, now as you've gone through the process, you've identified things that you thought you would be fine doing. Um, and now, you know, realizing how short life is, you know, where your priorities lie, that there's things that you probably never want to go back to. So um, can you share some of those things that, you know, our listeners are looking to maybe get started, maybe start investing, maybe buy their own. Um, What are some of those main things that you would say outsource as soon as you possibly can? Yeah. So I think it's always good when you get into any business to identify like what you're good at doing and what you like doing. And Mm -hmm. if you can identify those items, everything else that doesn't fit in that column, you should look to delegate as soon as you can. Um, 
another thing is like, there's so many things, and I'm learning this as I go. Uh, I didn't realize this a couple of years ago, but there's so many things in life that we do every day, whether, whether it's business or um, family, friends, dating, relationships, whatever it might be. There's so many little things that happen each day that like at the end of the day, like if they don't matter, right? A year from now, two years from now, you're going to look back and you're not going to remember, mm-hmm. um, you know, where you went out to dinner or you're not going to remember like, um, you know, the process that you took to sign those loan docs. Like it's just not going to matter. And so those items that like really are not going to matter a year from now, those items should all be delegated. And another takeaway too is like, and a lot of people don't want to give up control of their business, but um, like the 80% rule works. Like I, I truly believe that like if, if you can delegate and a task out that you're doing every single day that you just don't like doing or you hate doing it, consuming your time. If you can delegate it out and someone else can do that for you and they can do it 80% as good as you can do it, that's good enough. Yeah, that actually reminds me of um, somebody who we were talking to at a conference recently where uh-huh. he's just delegated his email and he has somebody who just manages his email and he just has five or 10 important emails a day instead of whatever the multiple of that is instead, right? It's that, yeah, it's that point like you were talking about. It. I mean, it's really an administrative minutia, right? It's easy to get trapped in and you mm-hmm. feel like you're doing something that's valuable, but really it's it's not it's not necessarily busy work, but it's just not adding as much value as, as what you really should be doing um, in order to make progress. Yeah, exactly. And then also like to, to piggyback off of your point there, Luke, like, like labeling how much these tasks are you doing how much, how much, how much your time is worth, you Mm -hmm. know, like, for example, like I had a big aha moment, um, recently. So I just refinanced that 11 unit property and it just closed a couple of days ago. The appraisal, the initial appraisal came back very low. And so I literally sat down for one hour of my time and I went through all of the recently sold apartment buildings in Cincinnati that I felt would help the, uh, appraisal dispute. It took one hour of my time, submitted it, and we got a new appraisal and it ended up increasing my loan proceeds by like 50 something thousand dollars, just that one hour. And so I, that was a huge aha moment for me. Like, wow, my time is worth $50,000 an hour right now. And so I shouldn't be um, out there doing all the little tiny things in the business that I just hated doing, you know, and, and a lot of those tasks were 10, $15 an hour tasks, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things that starting out, you have to do it, right? It's, there's Mm -hmm. nobody else to do it, but as soon as you have the the capacity, the manpower, you know, the, the income to be able to outsource it, you know, it's, you just, like you mentioned, right. It gives you the ability to focus on those $50,000 items that, you know, nobody else can move forward, right. Somebody else can, you know, schedule a calendar invite or whatever the case might be, but nobody else can do some of these things specific to you. So uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what those skill sets are for you, Rich. What do you feel is your your, your superpower? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I recently got into, uh, volunteering a little bit more. And so I, I like to give back. Um, I started volunteering with the, uh, the big, big brothers, big sisters program here in San Diego. So I have a, a, a little, his name is Isaac. He's uh, 11 years old and we get to hang out, uh, one or two times a month and go do some cool stuff. Um, so I think, I think I'm, I'm really getting into giving back. Um, when I was younger, I was never into it. Um, but as I've gotten older, I, I realize more and more, like the more you give, like the more you win, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. It's amazing too, as you get older too, to where you really want, I mean, you want to, you feel like you've built up all of this life experience and you have all this knowledge mm-hmm. and you want to be able to like pour it into somebody like there's, I don't know what it is yeah. for what it is as we get older, or maybe it's just being human. Like you want to be able to have an impact with somebody, especially when you see somebody who's like a third of your age and you're like, wow, this kid has so much potential. Like if I could just, you know, help him in this, this one little way, it could change potentially the whole entire trajectory of his life. 100%. And the other thing I really enjoy doing is like, uh, I love grabbing coffee with people or with like new investors that like are looking to get into the industry and they just want to, um, maybe take their first deal down, right? Or they want to buy an investment property. I love helping out individuals like that. I love, um, I always go and meet up with people for coffee or if they want to grab lunch. Um, I, I always do it within reason. Nice. Yeah. Nice. There you go. Yeah, you you, give, you of- give a little bit too much of your time though. Some, some <laughs> take advantage. So as long as, as long as it's within reason, I'm, I'm all about helping others out. 
Yes. Totally. Within reason and also feel your soul, right? I, yeah. I don't want to speak for you, but I, I feel like, you know, meeting somebody and seeing them progress and take action and then invest mm-hmm. and just, you know, that light bulb goes off and just knowing that you were a tiny bit of that process is just so rewarding. I don't know that there's another word for it. Yeah, I completely agree. 100%. You get hooked on it. Um, Can you tell us about your why? So, you know, very big picture. I want to take it a little bit more personal now in terms of, you know, what keeps it going for you? What drives you? What's the the motivation behind it all? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I think my why goes back to what we alluded to earlier in the show is I just don't want to regret anything in my life when I get older. And um, I don't know exactly where everything is going. I don't know where the real estate's going to take me or like these businesses and that sort of thing. I don't know what my end game is. Um, but my why is really, I don't want to, li- I don't want to regret anything when I get older. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a big why it's a, I, th- I think it's a really, really strong why, you know, I think remembering that you're going to die is, I mean, I think it's, this is actually a quote from Steve jobs, right. Um, it borrowed probably from stoicism way back when, but like remembering that you're going to die is, is one of the surest ways to, to make sure that you're not going to get fall into a trap of feeling like you have something to lose, right? Because you're not going to make it out of this whole journey alive anyway, right? So you might as well right. might as well do what you want while you while you're here. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, you're absolutely right. Time is is our our one asset that's not replaceable. It's it's yeah. scary to think about, but when I think about those things, it, it, that's that's what gets me up in in the morning, gets me out of bed. That's what gets Love me excited, it. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I want to actually ask a question as we start to wrap up and close out here that, sure. that typically Daisy will ask. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's, what do you feel like your biggest contribution is to the world thus far? Mm. I think that's a really, really deep question. I, I love, I love deep questions. Um, I think the biggest contribution thus far is those individuals that I've helped buy their first piece of real estate or buy their first apartment building or buy their first short-term rental. That's been the biggest thing I think I've done to date. Um, ask me again in a year or two, it might be something different, but I think thus far that that's definitely what it is. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, I can definitely say that you've guided us along that route, right, as we're looking to to buy ourselves. And so, you know, you and, um, you know, your team has just been so helpful in terms of, you know, the, the information and just knowledge that you've been able to share with us. So I um, appreciate that, you know, just you guys just being an open book, right, and, and always being uh, willing to share. And the last question for me, and, and I have to ask, I know we're kind of running low on time, but um, I have to ask, what does your family think about everything that you're doing now? You mentioned, oh, yeah. You know, um, you know, having family from Taiwan, immigrant family, I'm sure, you know, worked their butts off when they came here. Now they're seeing everything that you're doing. What do they think about it? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, they're they're definitely in support and they're they're definitely really, really proud of me. Um, I think at first when I was like getting into the real estate and cashing out my 401k, they thought that was a little bit risky um, and because uh, they didn't know how it was going to turn out, you know, and I think now they're starting to see some of the results and they're starting to see some of the the real estate that we own and um, they're starting to see some of that. And so they're very supportive. Um, but it was like, you know, they're their risk tolerance is definitely much different than mine, you know? Um, And so to them at first it was crazy, but now they're like, they're, they're pretty proud of me. There you go, man. Yeah. Yeah, You, uh, (laughs) you, you're turning them into believers. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. That's amazing. Well, thank you for, for sharing rich. And, you know, we're excited to see where three pack goes to see, you know, Mike, Sean and yourself and, you know, everything that you're going to do, not just with the multifamily journey and the podcast, but, um, just with, you know, all of your endeavors. I know, you know, the little time that we've known you guys, we've definitely been impressed just by the level of professionalism and support and, um, just being a resource to so many of us out there. And so definitely look up to you and, uh, you know, respect what you're doing and look forward to, to seeing you continue to grow and flourish. Yeah, likewise, likewise. And, and same to you guys. I'm, I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing. And I love a lot of the questions and the format on the on this podcast. I can tell that your listeners probably get a ton of value from from this format. But uh, yeah, thank you for everything that you guys do. It's It's been an honor. Yeah, yeah, of course. Appreciate you coming on and and uh, sharing your wisdom and sharing your time. Of course, right? The the, the non renewable resource and asset. Uh, where I mean, where can our listeners end up reaching out to? Right, they're listening right now. They're like, hey, 
I want to grab coffee and lunch with Rich because he said he does that with everybody. You know, where, <laughs> where can they where can they end up getting in contact with you? Yeah, yeah. You can follow me on Instagram at Rich underscore Summers, S-O-M-E-R-S. You can shoot me a DM. Um, I'm pretty active on Instagram. Um, and if you wanted to check out uh, our podcast, you can check us out, The Multifamily Takeoff. And then um, if you want to learn more about our uh, our fund that we're launching to buy short-term rentals, you can go to pack3capital.com. Or if you want to learn more about Fortune Cribs, you could go to fortunecribs.com. Awesome. We'll uh, we'll definitely make sure to have all that in the show notes, Rich. And, uh, you know, we appreciate you coming on. It's been awesome. And uh, with that, it wraps up yet another episode of Make It Rain, multifamily real estate investing for millennials and make it rain. Make it rain. (laughs) Thanks for listening. The best way to show support is to share it with anyone who might benefit from it and leave us an awesome review. Follow us on Instagram at Make It Rain Podcast and check us out on our website at MakeItRainPodcast.com for more goodies. Take action on your financial future today. See you on the next episode. See you soon.